time seamless. And this is FL Studio 20. The 20th version of FL Studio, but not really. It's actually the 13th version of FL Studio. The previous version was FL 12. This is called FL 20 because this is the 20th anniversary of FL's image line business. Um, along with that, there's also a bit of a joke because the first and most primary feature that is awesome about this new version of FL is that there is a Mac native version now. No more crossover, no more parallels, just an app. It's even cross compatible with the PC version. So if you get projects from PC users and you can put them in your, your thing and it'll work. If you've got all the same VSTs and the same uh, samples, hunky dory. It's also a bit of a joke because uh, in the in the manual and the fact in, in, in for forever, it used to joke that there would not be a Mac version until the 20th version of FL this is from forever ago. And now here we are. There's a Mac version. So I guess this is the 20th version. I, I think that's kind of funny. Anyway, let's get into what the new features in this one are <laughs> insofar as actually using the program. Um, there's a bunch of things. Uh, I got a list over here. There's there's a lot more than what are in this list. There's lots of tiny quality of life changes and also updates to plugins to allow you to do things like use use them because they're 64 bit now and that kind of thing. So you know most of that. But I have I have a big list of the big stuff. Mac, uh, the, the Mac thing is big. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of new new uh, new ways to freeze things. Um, there's options, for example, to use uh, the clips and the track. So each track, if you right click it, it comes in here, you have a consolidate option. And then you have this to just, it basically just renders it out as audio as if you had come in here inside the mixer, armed with the track, and then like gone into disc recording, I had to do that. Um, and it will either what it does, what it says there, it'll either do it from the beginning of the song or it'll do it from the beginning of when that track is active. Um, and if there's different sources and things in there, like if they're, they don't go to the same mixing thing or whatever, it'll still consolidate it, all of it. So, you know, you have to, plan ahead for its usage usage like you would with any other freezing any other any other kind of DAW um, there's also one extra option which is that you can uh, render and replace uh, patterns as audio clips from within the picker panel this thing is the picker panel by the way if you didn't know um, there's there's these options in here and there's there's two extra ones there's render and replace which is what I just said but then there's render as audio clip and quick render as audio clip Wender, what's the difference well render as audio clip gets you the regular audio like options and then quick render render um will not ask again it'll just render it again with whatever previous settings you have so if you for some reason need to do all the same thing a bunch of times you don't have to keep going in the window over and over again you can just say do it again do it again do it again and we'll be done again it's a good good time saving thing a lot of a lot of elements in this update are amazing workflow changes um and one particular good one is this one here there's this thing up here that says arrangement. What the heck is arrangement? Because it's right next to what says playlist, and that's supposed to be what that is in it. Except that now we can have just straight up whole more than one of them. <sighs> Fresh air of extra space. Well, um, and before, of course, you could you could take a you could make a marker. You could say one, just have a marker that is called anything, and then tell it that it's the song start. And then you could be like, cool, here's the sketch pad before where the thing begins. And whenever you rendered it, it would it would not count anything before this moment in time. Now that we just have a whole separate arrangement, more things that are more difficult to do inside a single playlist are possible. Because like the way I would handle things before is that if I wanted to do a particular like experimentation and sound is that I have to go someplace that's really far away down the timeline, away from my main arrangement. And now I can just have a main arrangement and a different arrangement. And now I could even make FLPs where I have like, I have my stupid unorganized, like really bad looking project. And then I have the clean one and you can have both, you know, and that's, that's just a neat, a neat addition. Is it, these are, these are the kinds of options that people in forums have been just spouting off and asking for forever. And it's really cool to just see them all just kind of get knocked off one by one. Um, oh yeah. So while we're in the playlist uh, and talk about markers, uh, we have the ability now to change the grid willy nilly and uh, offer actual time signature support. And you can uh, look what we're doing here: four, four, five, four, right? That, like that. See there. And much like the start thing I was doing earlier, you drag it around and it'll move the grid from that position onward to change the grid to be into that new time signature. You might be thinking, okay, wow. I thought the beats per step and steps per bar thing kind of made that hard because, yeah, it said 4-4 four, four and that meant 4-4, four, four, but when you try to do any other kind of time signature, it was a little bit difficult to get the translate for those numbers to mean the same thing that time signatures mean. And now there is straight up actual, like, a time signature, like, number setting that means what it means. Um, you can also, uh, they, I'm using the markers with the time signature version right now, so that means it's going to stay in time signature mode. But if I didn't do that, you could actually set it back to the old mode, the steps per beat, uh, beats per bar uh, uh, sequencer nomenclature, which is designed to talk sequencer. 
sequencer nomenclature, which is designed to talk to like synthesizers and things. And that's how that, that all that stuff in the analog stepping things, you know, worked. <clears throat> but for in the music theory sense, those numbers didn't translate to what a time signature meant. So now we have time signatures. Excellent stuff. Uh, also of note is that when you import MIDI, you now have the option to import time signatures uh, information. So that's kind of cool. You might notice while we've been doing this whole thing, there's also this big bar up here. And this is exactly what it looks like. It is a mini preview of your arrangement. Like uh, a lot of other DAWs have had. And this is just what that is. You get this option uh, up in here. There's uh, view. Yeah. View, menu, playlist, preview, and then enables, it turns it on, double height, which is what I have, because normally it would be the same, just the original scroll bar height, which you can keep or not keep, depending on what you want, because there's that option. And of course, show time markers, which is where it's showing the time markers. This option also exists to the piano roll. P.S. So you can see, like, I'm not sure this is necessarily everybody's experience with using FL, but there's a lot of things that I do accidentally that just warp me somewhere way down the timeline. And it's nice to be able to grab the scroll bar and instead of trying to like scan what I'm looking at in this like, oh my God, what's happening? I can actually like go up there and see a big, big old like zoomed out and a zoomed in like that. So I can like focus and it's cool. Like I'm describing a really basic benefit of a feature that has existed in lots of other DAWs for a very long time. So a lot of you already know what's happening, but I'm just, I'm just, it's really cool how well that works. This is, this is, this is the kind of stuff that like I've obviously not used, like I've not had um, as an avail an option to me for a long time, but then like I'm using it and it's like, wow, I can't imagine life without this. A lot of people liked um, the way that FL worked with the old blocks architecture in the playlist. And like, I was fine with that when it, when it was the thing, but then when the clips came around, I had like, could not imagine going back. It's just interesting how quickly people can adjust these things. Cool. Um, last thing about the playlist, I think, uh, I say, I think, cause this list is quite long is that there are now 500 tracks. Um, the tracks used to be, I don't remember, remember what the max was because I have never encountered them. Ooh, not the last thing about the playlist because it's actually this grouping thing, which I didn't even put in the list because I forgot about it. But what's cool about this is that before when you collapsed it, pff, actually, I have it enabled. Cool. Um, is that in here and this, I really forget where this particular option exists because I turned it on and I didn't want to turn it off again because it was just really good. There it is. High collapse group tracks. So if you didn't do that, this is what you would get. And this seems fine. You know, you can shift, scroll, move the, move the whole thing around and, and collapse and uncollapse. But the downside of this particular view, if you have a lot of grouped tracks, like if you have a million automation clips or like lots of video or whatever, is that like you, even if there's like 10 of them, you'll still have quite the vertical like space taken up by that, even if you're on the smallest setting of this guy up here. Um, what's important about that is you still can't see the information though. You can't see what the automation clips are doing or what the whatever is doing. You just know they're there and you kind of already knew that, didn't you? Um, depending on how you're setting this up, like my thought would be to be like, here's where all the MIDI goes and here's what the stuff stuff's doing. And then like, I can either have it do this where it's, you know, mitigated uh, somewhat and that's kind of okay, but uh, it's a lot better to just come in here and be like, now it's all gone unless I want to see it. So if I want to see it, I can see it. And or I'm just not being having my, my visual space wasted by information that's not even giving me information. You know what I mean? So that's why I like that a lot. Okay, so the next big thing is uh, changes to PDC. PDC stands for plug-in delay compensation. If you're not familiar with what that means, is that pretty much whenever you add any effect onto anything, um, it creates a certain amount of processing. And <clears throat> depending on what the kind of processing it is, that processing might take time or not. In the case of, say, for example, this uh, compressor, uh, this here is a look ahead delay uh, setting, and so is this. And uh, this is measured in milliseconds. See that huge di difference in space there? That is me hitting the note, and then that's when the note's getting heard. That is a delay. Now, like, this is me intentionally adding delay, and I'm not even doing anything with the compressor to make it actually utilize this function at all, but other things can just add up. And the, diff the problem, you know, the difference between different processing chains is the problem. Because if you say, if you tell everything to hit at one time and they have different stuff on them, they're not going to all come out as if they hit the same time. Plugin delay compensation compensates for that delay in the plugins. And it does that by delaying the things that are shorter to be, take as long as the things that are longer. Um, the cool thing about this particular update, other than that they changed it so that it works a lot better, it also works on inputs and audio and things like that. Um, it also works in the wet dry on the effects in the effects list. See how that worked there? It was a little bit weird, but what would have happened if this were 
the before the update is that we would not have heard the the dry signal having a delay. Now the dry signal is being delayed so that we can see it. Um, we can hear it like happening in parallel with the process signal. Beforehand, it wouldn't do that. It would just cause phasing and that'd be bad or good, depending on what you're using it for. But this is better to have that choice. What else is good about that? Oh, so we're in the mixer. A um, bunch of changes in the mixer. There's more mixer inserts. Uh, we saw that big list of stuff I have back here at the bottom. Actually, that's, there's more than just that because I made this template before that happened. Here it is, 125. There's, I think they're saying there's more coming, but there's more now. And that's neat. Um, I'm using the alt view right now. We can see it happening. Uh, this is the names on the bottom versus the names on the top. I kind of still prefer the names on the top, but I can see why some people might want that. Um, also, you can see how a lot of this stuff is like outlined really, really intensely. And that's because I have engaged high visibility mode in the general settings. Um, and this is something that like is good for, oh, where is it? Uh, ah, here it is, high visibility. Uh, this is good for if you have, I guess, vision vision impairment. I say I guess because I'm using it because I, if I'm going to do videos with this stuff, I think it's handy to have as, as much indication of what's happening as possible. So, yay for FL for that. Yes, okay, so that was more, more of that and more of those. There's some plugin updates too. Um, there's this guy, the VFX Level Scaler, which is a MIDI plugin, uh, uh, kind of a, a voice effect, which is what VFX stands for. And this lets you scale all of these parameters, these guys, velocity, release, pitch, pan, mod X, mod Y. And <clears throat> this is all like, just the various kinds of information that gets sent around into voices information from one plugin to the next. Most FL plugins already have this kind of thing built in and you are perfectly able to screw with it yourself. Um, the thing is, is that most third-party plugins, while they will have a, a modicum of control, it's probably not that deep. Uh, so you could put this in between you hitting notes and then the notes getting conditioned to do something with the other plugin that you can very, very, very well tune in. That's what I like. I like about that. Uh, lots of uh, the in-depthness of being specific about it, like especially because I like if I ever want to do anything with like a uh, trigger pad or a MIDI of any kind that needs to be performed. If the MIDI isn't in an excruciatingly specific like range of set area and that there's like control of velocity because of how hard I'm hitting it. Like if I can't be that perfect, then I can sort of force it to be perfect. Uh, other voice effect plugins are things like the keyboard splitter, which uh, sets out different MIDI for different like zones of the keyboard and then the color and the key mapper, which will uh, help uh, keep notes in line if they're not, in the, or even make chords per note, that kind of thing. Those are what the voice effects plugins are. They are making effects out of the voices you're hitting. Other plugin updates, there's a lot of them, but the one I want to focus on, the one that I think is the coolest, is this one here with the reverb tube. Um, it has added... <laughs> I'm still putting that compressor on it. They has added this here mod section. It's to break up the monotony of what is essentially a very dry, unmodulated reverb. It's like I've I've there's defined reverb and with the convolver, like you could do a lot of work with it. So it's not like I've really necessarily cared about this, but just about every other reverb ever has this kind of modulation honestly even deeper than this but this is enough this is enough to like uh, do the job which they say that this to do which is to break up the monotony but you can also just modulate this directly which means that you can enjoy reverb modulation to a certain degree with things like bass processing which i do a lot i happen to enjoy that update uh what am i using up okay cool Ooh. all right so uh there's now a score logger i actually don't know how long this has been in here this might have been a 12.5 like beta feature but uh, what the scroll log does is it records every one of your every all of your MIDI input your whole time you're doing what you're doing, and then you can tell it to dump the log a into a pattern. And what it'll do when you dump the log, uh, uh, as well as like like like, like so here's an example of like wow where am I in the in the MIDI, and like now I can see it with this like preview thingy. Oh, this is great. Um, all this crap that's happening up here that I'm doing like I don't even think you guys heard me do this. I think it might have been when I was experimenting. But point is is that that up to a half an hour it will remember all the things you do. And then it will dump it into uh, the channels that you triggered. In this case, I only triggered this particular channel, so we're only seeing the information that's in this channel. But if I have more than this channel and I triggered more than that channel, it would go into the channel that was triggered. It would still be in this one pattern. It would be in this one big, long pattern, but it would still be the, the thing that you triggered. So it's not just like dumb, all, only the minute you hit in. It's also what you hit, which is cool. So you never have to worry about losing something awesome you did by accident, as long as it's a midi thing. Uh, what else is good? Okay, user data, important thing. Um, they changed where the primary user data folder is by default. It's by default in your documents folder. I don't know what that is on Mac, but the idea is that it's not in the FL directory anymore. 
um, by default. I keep saying by default because you can change it. There's this little button here that lets you set where your data thing is. And then also per project, you can set a data folder if you didn't know that, um, which it helps helps to like, you really don't want to save your stuff like too much in the FL directory because you can tell like, uh, like I have, I have this, this seamless folder here and like, that's not originally in the FL directory. So like I have all my crap in there. I don't need to have it in the directory. And the value of it is that like, for whatever reason, if I need to trash the directory and reinstall FL or update it or whatever, or move things and reinstall FL, I don't have to be scrambling figuring out what folder has something I made that I need for a project somewhere and then solving that by just saving the FL directory, which is what I used to do uh, before I, you know, cared more about my file systems. Anyway, that was an important update. And the last thing I want to talk about before we're done for today is what goes on in the about page, which now has an area for you to enter in your account name and password if you're an FL user, which means that you can unlock your, your account from here without having to go to the website and get the red key and install the red key if you don't want to do that. I guess there's reasons for that to be a thing. Um, I've just been I've been used to downloading that red key for so long that I've that's never been a thing I guess there that someone might have cared about. But I absolutely know that there are definitely reasons someone might care about that. Anyway, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to ADSR and all of that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.